Hi guys, Emmy Darkman here. St Kilda is a coastal town located about 20 kilometers north of Adelaide in South Australia. Despite having a population of only 70 people, the town is universally known to almost everyone in Adelaide because it is home to the enormous St Kilda Adventure Playground. Featuring a giant castle, pirate ship and many slides, it is arguably the best known playground in the state and is the go-to location for children during school holidays, with parents bringing their kids from far and wide to keep them occupied for the day. However, there is a lesser known attraction that also exists in St Kilda, the St Kilda Mangroves. In 1984, a boardwalk was constructed through the mangroves, allowing visitors to appreciate and learn about the mangrove's ecological importance. In 1995, the interpretive center was built, a building which housed interactive displays through which visitors could learn about the mangroves. The trail became extremely popular with guides offering tours to groups which often consisted of primary school students who would visit the playground after a trip to the mangroves. As a child, I personally spent a lot of time at St Kilda, visiting the adventure playground many times and even going on a school excursion to the mangrove trail. So, when I heard this on the news, this is what the mangrove south of St Kilda Road looked like in 2019. This is what they look like now. This is a disaster of international significance. The damage is, is still occurring. It hasn't been fixed and we need to act. The Dry Creek mine closed down seven years ago and environmentalists believe the salt pans have dried and cracked, sending a solution of super saline water into the neighbouring mangroves. Wildlife experts say it's already devastated 10 hectares. The Dry Creek salt fields, which we've known for years, decades, are incredibly important for our migratory shorebirds. I was in shock. Somehow, water with unnaturally high levels of salt had crept into the mangrove forest and had already killed off large portions of it. And what was worse was that this was no natural occurrence. The hypersaline water had leaked in from a nearby salt production facility. This was extremely saddening for me to hear. After all, this isn't even the first ecological disaster I've covered. Many of you would have seen the video I made about Mutton Cove. But was there really another ecological disaster going on, right now, destroying one of my favourite childhood spots? There was only one way to find out. Upon arriving at the mangrove trail, I realised that I couldn't just walk right in. To gain access to the trail, you need to go into the local tackle shop, St Kilda Tackle and Tucker, and obtain a swipe card to the gate. To do so, you must present some identification and a $20 deposit. The $20 is obviously to stop you from keeping or stealing the pass, but why even have a pass in the first place? I've never seen this on any other trail. My theory is that the mangrove trail is somewhat dangerous and isolated, and this process allows a record to be kept of who's in the trail at any given time. That way, if someone doesn't return by the time the trail closes, someone will at least be aware. Once I had gotten my pass and entered the trail, it was immediately obvious that some things just weren't quite right. Firstly, well, I was the only one here. A newspaper article from 1994 advertising the trail had claimed that bookings were essential and even coming here as a kid I remember there being many tour groups that accompanied us through the trail. However, that was definitely no longer the case. Remember how I mentioned that interpretive centre? The trail guides visitors through that building at the beginning before commencing the trail proper. However, this building had definitely seen better days. There was a desk where a guide would usually sit, but there was not a soul around, and I doubt someone had sat here for a long time. There were still some displays in the centre, but the interactive ones no longer worked. Honestly, I felt like some urban explorer 
walking through some long abandoned building. But no, this was the entrance to a nature trail that was still open. But, for whatever reason, whether cost or politics, the building was no longer actively staffed or maintained. After exiting the interpretive centre, I noticed something else odd. The trail immediately forked in two. However, one of these paths was blocked, with no explanation given. If we look at this map, which is displayed in the interpretive centre, we get a better idea of what the trail looks like. This path to the south was the one that was blocked. As I would later discover, there was another locked door located further down the trail, just after the lookout. Because of these two locked gates, this effectively meant that over half the trail had been closed off to the public. I would later discover this had been done sometime in late 2020 due to large sections of the boardwalk falling into disrepair. Again, for whatever reason, the decision had been made not to maintain any of this, and so what was once a bustling trail had now been reduced to a fraction of its former size. So, I took the only path that was available to me. Immediately, I found what I'd come to look for, and it didn't look good. and miles of dead mangroves. Whatever had happened here had been brutal, and these plants looked like something out of a war zone. I continued to walk the path and just found more and more destruction. Signs which had once described parts of the mangrove forest no longer matched up with what was displayed in front of them, with nothing but dead sticks as far as the eye could see. The news reports were indeed correct. Something had happened here, and whatever it was, it had shown no mercy. I was saddened to see this. This place no longer resembled the place I'd once visited as a child. But quickly, my sadness turned to disappointment. How had this happened? And why was nothing seemingly being done about this? Well, allow me to take you down the rabbit hole of the sequence of events that had led to this widespread destruction, and hopefully we will find our answer. Our story begins in December 2020. News outlets first began reporting that there was a massive die-off of mangroves in St Kilda. The National Parks and Wildlife SA Executive Director Mike Williams said at this point in time that it's too early to speculate what the cause could be. Others had made guesses at the cause. Mangrove Watch Director Jock McKenzie suggested it may have been caused by climate change but said he would not rule out something more directly human related, like a chemical runoff event. As it would turn out, his latter guess wasn't too far off. A month later, the cause was officially determined to be contamination of the mangroves by hypersaline water, which had leaked in from the nearby salt pans. This water was supposedly 10 times more salty than seawater, which was far more than mangroves could handle, causing them to die quite rapidly. But surely, you might ask, weren't there checks in place to prevent such an incident from happening? A salt pan located right next to a nature reserve would surely be heavily monitored, right? How could such a leak occur? Well, allow me to explain. Thanks to some great independent research, it has since been established exactly how this was allowed to happen. These two images, which explain the situation, were posted to the Save St Kilda Mangroves Facebook page. And I really have to take my hat off to the members there. They've done a lot of work bringing this issue to light and trying to resolve it. To understand these images, 
we first need to understand the geography of the area. To the west is the mangroves, with the trail running through it. To the east of the mangroves is a salt pan named Pond PA6. This salt pan is decommissioned, that is, it's no longer meant to be used. This is because the salt pond has cracked and compromised gypsum deposits, which meant that any liquid stored in the pond would eventually seep out. Despite this being an issue, it was not deemed to be a threat to the environment so long as the pond was no longer used. You can probably see where I'm going with this. To the north of PA6 is another salt pan named Pond PA45. This salt pan, unlike PA6, is still in use and at the time of the incident was being used to store waste brine, a mixture of water and salt, a lot of salt. Between the two ponds lies a pumping basin which allows water from either pond to be directed to a discharge pipeline where the water can be processed and released to sea. Now, at the time of the incident, the company that operates the ponds, Buckland Dry Creek, was attempting to move the waste brine in Pond PA45 into the pumping basin so it could be cleaned up and eventually discharged to sea. However, instead of being moved to the pumping basin, the water was instead moved into PA6 which was no longer meant to be used due to the cracked gypsum deposits. Despite the obvious mistake, the water remained in the ponds and was not moved for a very long time. How long you might ask? Well, at the time the disaster was first reported by the media, which was in December 2020, the water was still in Pond PA6. Just two months ago, the results of some Freedom of Information Acts were published by the local newspaper, which revealed that this pumping incident had occurred in February 2020. This means that the water sat in a structurally unsound pond for a minimum of 10 months before the damage became apparent to the media. This was enough time for the hypersaline water to seep through the cracks into the mangroves which caused this disaster to occur. Now, mangroves, if you weren't aware, are effectively trees that grow in salt water. They have the biological ability to filter out salt from the water. However, even mangroves have their limits and this water that seeped in had artificially high salt levels, much higher than the mangroves usually have to tolerate. The effect, plain and simple, was that this water killed a large majority of the plants. In fact, this incident has gotten so bad that there is now a Wikipedia article about it, which cites that the spill is now a candidate to be South Australia's worst marine environmental disaster. As you can see, the damage is extremely widespread, with estimates of the size of the affected area ranging from 24 to 150 hectares. Now, I wanted to show you some satellite imagery of the affected area. However, most of the usual sources of satellite data were out of date. Google Earth's data only goes up to February 2019. Microsoft's Bing Maps seems to be out of date as well. In fact, of my usual sources, the only two that seemed to show the damage on their imagery were Esri and Maxar. As you can see, the brown patches of dead mangroves are clearly visible. However, while I was producing this video, a close friend of mine introduced me to an online tool called the Sentinel Hub EO Browser, and honestly, this thing is ridiculously impressive. The EO Browser is a tool that allows you to browse the datasets obtained by the Sentinel satellites operated by the European Space Agency. Now, there are two satellites of interest here. The Sentinel-2 takes regular satellite imagery, much like you'd see on Google Earth. It's not as high resolution as Google's photography, but the main difference here is that there is new Sentinel imagery every day, so it is much more up to date. The other satellite, Sentinel-1, is a bit different. It's a synthetic aperture radar, which means it uses pulses of radio waves to illuminate a scene. This allows it to see things a regular satellite camera might not. Using the Sentinel-2 satellite, I was able to obtain up-to-date imagery of the impacted location. Note the three brown spikes where the dead mangroves are. But what's really interesting is that the EO browser allows you to see a time-lapse of all the historic imagery. Here's a time-lapse from February 2020, when the leak first occurred, until now. If you look closely, you can see the three spikes of dead mangroves begin to form pretty rapidly. 
But where it gets really interesting is when we use the Sentinel-1 satellite with the radar imagery. With this radar, we can see damage we wouldn't otherwise see. There's a number of different visualizations for this radar. This one, the moisture index, shows a heat map of the moisture at each point. In the time lapse of this visualization, it's a lot easier to see the three spikes form as the salt rapidly removes the moisture from the area. Upon seeing this for the first time, it was striking how much the damage stands out. You couldn't see this on a regular satellite picture. Another visualization, this one for vegetation, also clearly shows the die-off of the mangroves as the lush mangrove forests turned into nothing more than dead sticks. So it's pretty obvious now, the damage is extremely severe. So the question now is, what's next? So now we know what happened and we know now what caused it to happen. So what's being done to fix the issue? In February 2021, hundreds attended a protest urging the government for action to resolve this ecological disaster. In March of 2021, work began to pump the water out of Pond PA6 to prevent any further damage from occurring. While it was initially reported that this pumping had been successful in removing water, over 16 million litres worth, it was shortly after reported that the pumping had failed, as they had simply moved the water from one leaking pond to another, where it continued to contaminate the local area. In August 2021, it was reported that the leaking had been observed again, and even worse was that another article mentioned that this time, trees and plants in residential areas of St Kilda had also started to die, suggesting that this problem had become much worse than originally thought. Residents had begun to grow increasingly concerned, stating that the government was offering them no help, with the government seemingly giving up on trying to fix the problem. This all came to a head in September 2021, when a group of St Kilda locals got together, hired some pumping equipment using funds from a $3,000 GoFundMe campaign, and began an effort to pump the water themselves. They were apparently able to move 18 tonnes of salt to another safer location on the salt pan owner's property, where they stated the owner will be able to discharge it to the Bolivar Channel themselves. However, during the pumping process, police were called and the residents were asked to withdraw the pipes. One of the residents stated that it was quite evident that it was the miner, that is the salt pan owner, who asked for police to move me on. And it's really evident that he doesn't want the cleanup done for him and he doesn't want to clean up. Additionally, the Energy and Mining Department said the citizen action was not necessary, pointing to their peer-reviewed scientific report that showed the area of dieback at St Kilda was smaller than first thought. This report is heavily disputed by the residents who claimed it failed to take many factors into account. And that brings us to today. The government nor the media have made any statement on this issue since October 2021. And this is unsurprising. The government isn't doing anything in the area, so nothing has changed, which means there's nothing to report on. This doesn't mean the issue has disappeared, however, not least of all for the residents who live in St Kilda and still have to face this issue every day. The Facebook page I mentioned earlier, Save St Kilda Mangroves, is run by residents of St Kilda and is the only source I could still find talking about this issue. Just recently, in December 2021, the page posted a 53 minute video describing the current status of the situation. The video is presented by mother and daughter duo Perry and Faith Coleman, who are not only local residents but are both scientists too. They have really become the face of the residents in this whole debacle. The video gives a magnificent history of the mangroves and salt pans going back seven years and goes into great detail that I unfortunately won't get to cover in this video, so I'll leave a link in the description. However, most notable in this video is that it lays out a plan for the future.
So, where does this leave us? In the aforementioned video, Perry Coleman describes how the second round of environmental damage observed in August of 2021 was caused by rain redissolving the high salt content in the pond, which then leaked into the mangroves again. Perry speculated that the next wet season in 2022 would cause the rain to do the exact same thing, meaning that a third round of serious environmental damage is likely to occur around August of 2022. In fact, this yearly cycle is likely to repeat indefinitely until the remaining salt is removed from the damaged pond. The government does not share this same view, unfortunately, and as such, government intervention to try and prevent this further damage seems unlikely. In this video, they describe three methods for remediation. The first option is to continue with the work that was stopped by police. That is, to pump the water to the safer location where it can be processed and discharged. The second solution is to let the problem naturally leak out over the period of a decade or more, whilst enduring any unforeseen damage this may cause in the meantime. The final option is to cap the ponds with soil. That is, if enough soil is placed on top of the cracked ponds, Further rains will not be able to mobilise the salt again and significantly slows down the leaching of the salt into the mangroves. Of the three options, the last option is the cheapest, quickest and most cost-effective method, which obviously means it is the most likely option to be selected by the government. But why hasn't this option been implemented yet, over a year after the incident? I'll let the Coleman's tell you themselves. But there is this, this huge challenge in life to step through things logically. Um, and because this is such a large site and there's such a diversity of issues, there's different issues at the crystallizers at the southern end to um, the what we used to call the bird ponds north of St Kilda to the seawater ponds up at Middle Beach to this patch this really unique patch at the moment with the gypsum crust in the gypsum ponds. They each have their own issues. And unless people can separate out each of the impacts and the areas, it turns into a bit of a mangled mess. And I, and I suspect a lack of that stepping through and understanding the different challenges is why we have what we have today. To be honest with you, I don't know what the future of the mangroves are. And neither, it seems, does anyone else. This is still an ongoing situation, and there's no ending to this story just yet. But one can only hope that common sense prevails, action is taken to fix the problem, whatever that fix may be, and the mangroves are restored to their former greatness. If you're interested in finding out more, I'll put links in the description for how you can stay up to date. But for now, we can only wait and see. This has been NB Darkman. Thanks for watching.